America's eight scariest serial killers in history. The United States has been home to some of the worst serial killers in human history. These American serial killers have some of the highest number of victims in history, arguably making them the scariest human beings on the planet. Although there are many other prolific serial killers throughout the world, the United States has one of the largest groups of killers with 10 or more victims. Although some serial killers boast of hundreds of victims to their names, others have a more terrifying, if not lower number, of kills. 1. Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer. He may be America's most prolific serial killer. Yet the name Gary Ridgway as known as the Green River Killer is not as well known when compared to the many other murderers who have haunted our nation's headlines. Convicted of killing 49 women, over the course of two decades, Ridgway has confessed to killing almost twice that number, and admitted in later statements that he claimed so many lives he lost count. A man of contradictions, Ridgway was a door-to-door -door proselytizer who read the Bible aloud both at work and at home. He was a married man twice by the early 1980s when his murder spree began. At the same time, Ridgway regularly frequented prostitutes. Many of the killer's victims were sex workers, whom he targeted, because he hated most of them, and they were easy to pick up. He also preyed upon young runaways, and other women in vulnerable positions. Ridgway had sex with many of his victims, before he killed them. He also returned to the disposal site, to have sex with the bodies. The majority of the murders occurred near Seattle, and Tacoma, Washington. Many of the bodies were then dumped along the banks of the Green River, a 65-mile stretch of water due south of Seattle, that earned the killer his nickname. In order to pick up his victims, Ridgway would make small talk and show them photographs of his son. In truth, according to Ridgway himself, he just wanted to, uh, get the victim in the vehicle and eventually kill her. Ridgway's victims were usually strangled either by hand or by ligature. In his confessions, Ridgway said that he turned to ligature because he was afraid that the defensive wounds his victims sometimes left on his arms would give him away. Ridgway intentionally dumped the bodies in out-of-the-way places, once leaving Washington state entirely to dispose of two of the bodies near Portland, Oregon and confuse the police. He also left false clues around the dump sites to throw off suspicion including gum and cigarettes, that had been used by other people. This partially explains why it took authorities until 2001 almost 20 years after his first confirmed murder to arrest Ridgway, when DNA evidence finally linked him to four of the victims. Though he became a suspect in the case early on, Ridgway took and apparently passed a polygraph test in 1984. Later, however, a quality control review determined that he had actually failed the test, and that it hadn't been caught at the time. In 1985, he met Judith Mawson, who would become his third wife in 1988. During that time, his number of murders dropped off substantially. Though she was unaware of Ridgway's murderous predilections until, after his arrest, Mawson would later state that she thought she had saved lives by being his wife and making him happy. When Ridgway was finally arrested in 2001, it was initially only in connection with four murders. Three more murders were added, after forensic scientists connected spray paint traces found on the bodies of victims with a type of paint used at the Kenworth Truck Factory, where Ridgway worked as a painter. In order to avoid the death penalty, Ridgway agreed to a plea bargain in which he admitted to a much larger number of murders helping police find the missing bodies of several of his victims. He initially pleaded guilty to 48 murders, 42 of which were on the list of probable victims of the Green River Killer. An additional murder of an unidentified woman, discovered in 2003, was added to his convictions, giving him the most confirmed kills of any serial killer in American history. In his statements, Ridgway confessed to claiming still more lives, as many as 71. Chillingly, he referred to killing young women as his career. 2. Donald Harvey. A distinct odor, 
The scent of burnt almonds, turned a routine autopsy into a murder investigation, and then into a probe of one of the country's worst serial killers. The dead man, John Powell, 44, had been in a motorcycle accident in July 1986, that landed him at Cincinnati's Daniel Drake Memorial Hospital, with massive head injuries. For months, he was unresponsive, suffering seizures, embolisms, pneumonia and bed sores. No one, not even his wife, was surprised when, in early March 1987, Powell took his last breath. There were no suspicions of foul play. The man had been lingering in the margins of life for months. Who would bother to kill him? All that changed with one whiff of burnt almonds, which is the telltale odor of cyanide. Detectives soon turned their attention, to the last person to see Powell alive, hospital orderly Donald Harvey, 35. Police brought him in for questioning. It did not take long for him to break. I did it, Harvey admitted. He calmly told of how, he poured half a vial of cyanide into Powell's feeding tube, and flushed the rest of the poison down the toilet. When asked why, Harvey said, I felt sorry for him, and for his family. It seemed a classic case of mercy killing. Harvey was charged with a single murder, and that's how it might have stayed had it not been for the observation of a television newsman, wrote attorney William Whalen in defending Donald Harvey. WCPO-TV anchor Pat Minarson questioned, the reporter at the scene, asking if there would be any investigation, into other deaths at the hospital. The answer, on the day of Harvey's arraignment, was number then Minarson started digging, talking to about 50 Drake nurses, patients and staffers. He found evidence of a string of suspicious deaths. Minarson contacted Waylon, Harvey's lawyer, and asked him to question his client about whether Powell was his only victim. The answer was startling. WCPO ran a half-hour special that raised the possibility that as many as 70 or more patients had died from Harvey's ministrations. Born April 15, 1952, Harvey's young life was filled with all kinds of people, events, and pathologies that are a formula for growing up a serial killer. His family was dirt poor, his parents had knocked down screaming fights, and as a young boy he had fallen several times, hitting his head. Older cousins sexually abused him. He took an axe to the only pet he ever had, a chick. At 18, he went to visit an elderly uncle, who was convalescing in Marymount Hospital in London, Kentucky, and found his life calling, caring for lost causes. He charmed his way into a job there. Before long, the hospital's death rate started to rise. Harvey would later confess that his first victim at Marymount was a nasty old drunk, Logan Evans, 88, a stroke victim. On May 30, 1970, Evans was thrashing about, covered in his own filth. As Harvey tried to tend to him, Evans grabbed him, smearing feces on the orderly's face. So Harvey smothered him with a pillow. What followed was a string of deaths of the hospital's most frail patients. More than a dozen died on Harvey's watch, before he quit in March 1971. A few months later, he joined the Air Force but was discharged in nine months when revelations surfaced about a previous burglary arrest. For a time, Harvey bounced from one hospital job to the next. In his private life, he advanced his studies in witchcraft, and his activities with neo-Nazi groups, Karl Hotweiler. Soon Hotweiler wasn't feeling so well, and people around him were even worse. A friend came down with hepatitis. Three neighbors and Hotweiler's father and brother-in-law died. No one made the observation that the one common denominator was the Harvey. All had had one or more meals prepared by him. Even a neighbor's old dog died after Harvey took care of him. No one probed too deeply into his background and the history of mysterious deaths at other medical facilities, when he applied for a job at Drake. No questions were asked regarding the reason for his dismissal, carrying a gun, from his last job at the Cincinnati VA hospital. In February 1986, Harvey started working in long-term care at Drake. Within two months, patients began dying. As with the other killings, no one really questioned what had pushed these patients into the afterlife. They were all very ill, 
and it didn't take much to do them in. Harvey used different methods, smothering, rat poison, arsenic, to snuff out 24 patients in 13 months. By the time Powell's murder put an end to his deadly hobby, Harvey had been at it for 18 years. He confessed to killing somewhere between 70 and 87 people, but it was impossible to substantiate the claim. He did it out of compassion for their suffering, to put people out of their misery, Harvey insisted, although many of the killings were clearly provoked by rage, hatred or jealousy. In August 1987, Harvey pleaded guilty to two dozen counts of murder, and received four consecutive sentences of 20 years to life. Killings in other hospitals earned him, another 11 life sentences. The angel of death will be in his 90s, before his first possible parole in 2043. 3. John Wayne Gacy There are many serial killers, that operated within the United States in the past century. The truly prolific among them stand out, as examples of the chilling brutality, of a human mind gone terribly wrong. John Wayne Gacy, who tormented the teenage boys, and young men of 1970s Chicago, is one of America's three most prolific serial killers. Dressed as Pogo the Clown, the calculating murderer was a beloved fixture at local fundraisers, and parades, even performing at children's parties. All the while, the man who would be known, as the killer clown hid a terrible secret. The Past of John Wayne Gacy John Wayne Gacy had a troubled childhood, riddled with abuse that persisted through troubled behavior, and repeated physical illness culminating in leaving home for Las Vegas, where a troubling incident during a stint as a mortuary assistant left, Gacy begging to come home. He graduated from business school, married a local girl, Marlon Myers and took over management of her father's Kentucky Fried Chicken franchises. After joining the Springfield JCs, a local political organization, Gacy was exposed to homosexual experiences, for the first time in his life. The First Murder Gacy's first murder took place on, or around January 2, 1972, after his first divorce, and before his second marriage. He met Timothy McCoy at the city's Greyhound bus terminal in downtown Chicago. Gacy promised to give the boy a tour of the city, which he did. He also offered the boy a safe space, to sleep overnight with a guarantee, that he would return the boy in time, to catch his bus. A misunderstanding about breakfast resulted, in Gacy waking to the sight of McCoy holding a kitchen knife. Gacy wrestled the knife from McCoy's hand, slammed the boy's head against the bedroom wall, kicked him repeatedly, and then straddled and stabbed him to death. This first murder drained Gacy, but the fact that it resulted in an orgasm triggered, the association in his mind between murder, and thrill-seeking. Gacy buried McCoy's body in his crawlspace then covered the grave with a layer of concrete. This murder set much of John Wayne Gacy's notorious M.O. into action. He would kill a known 32 additional times, and bury 26 of these bodies in the crawl space of his home. McCoy's murder, however, was the only one in which John Wayne Gacy used a knife. In every other murder, the victim died of strangulation or asphyxiation with a tourniquet. Crowded with dead bodies, by the time cops were closing in on Gacy's connection with the murders, he was quite literally running out of room. His new method of disposing of bodies was to throw them into the Day Plains River via the I-55 bridge. Gacy's murders had become so numerous. By then, anyone who fit the young male profile he had in mind was enough to make someone an ideal victim. One of John Wayne Gacy's last murders was that of 20-year-old James Matsara of Elmwood Park. He was strangled after Thanksgiving dinner with his family. Gacy's killing spree ends. In December of 1978, Gacy's facade fell apart after someone witnessed him with the teenage stock boy, Robert Piast, before he disappeared. A prior conviction for sodomy that had gone long ignored enabled police to get a warrant to search Gacy's home. There they found troubling evidence and a rancid stench of dead bodies in the crawl space. Police easily made the connection between Gacy and the many disappearances. He confessed to over 30 murders, and the jury convicted him 33 times. On May 10, 1994, 
The highly publicized and anticipated execution took place, and John Wayne Gacy died by lethal injection. 4. Jane Topan. Topan embarked on a killing spree across Massachusetts in 1895, eventually ending up in Bourne during the sweltering summer of 1901. History tells us that her first gape victim was an old friend, who went to Cambridge to visit Topan's apartment in July 1901. Mary Maddie Davis, and her husband, Alden, a prominent figure in Catalment, had previously rented space to Topan at their property, on the street now called Mystery Lane. Davis stopped in Cambridge, and returned to the gape in a casket, a presumed victim of heart failure. But authorities later came to suspect otherwise. Topan came to the gate for the funeral, and ended up moving in with the remaining Davis family. They trusted her implicitly, Rani said, noting that Topan had a reputation as a quality nurse. They thought she was there to help them. Then the rest of the family started dying, according to historical documents, and published newspaper reports at the time. Topan managed to wipe out the entire family within six weeks. First, according to history, Topan poisoned Genevieve Gordon, Alden and Maddie's married daughter, who was bedridden with grief over her mother's death. Less than two weeks later, Alden Davis fell ill and died. Then a second daughter, Mary D. Minnie Gibbs, died in early August. Topan returned to the Boston area where it is alleged that she poisoned the husband of her late foster sister, but then nursed him back to health. Law enforcement officials were tipped off, by suspicious Gibbs family members, and on October 29, 1901, Topan was arrested. She later admitted to her attorney, that she killed 11 people, including the four members of the Davis clan, according to Harold Schechter, a Queens College professor who wrote a book about her called, Fatal. The poisonous life of a female serial killer. She was one of the most prolific serial killers in American history, Schechter said. He said Topan would alter poison dosages to prolong a patient's suffering, sometimes over weeks. At times, she climbed into bed with her victims and embraced them during their death throes, according to Schechter's research. She was a lust killer, he said. These people are extreme sexual psychopaths who derive pleasure from death. It was a quick trial at the Barnstable County Courthouse, in 1902 where Topan admitted, that she was sexually aroused while watching her victims writhe and die. Topan was found not guilty by reason of insanity, and sentenced to an asylum in Taunton where she died in 1938 at age 84. The Topan legacy of death is viewable today at the Jonathan Bourne Historical Center, where a doll collection features Topan, and the Davis family victims, a grisly reminder of one of the Gapes, most legendary murders. The dolls were made by Madeline Sharon, the granddaughter of Captain Gibbs, the husband of Mary Gibbs, one of Topan's victims. 5. Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy killed at least 30 women, during his murderous streak in the early 1970s. Bundy kidnapped killed, and raped his victims in Colorado, California, Idaho, Oregon, Utah, Florida, and Washington. He was caught in 1978, sentenced to death, and executed in the electric chair in 1989. 10 Dark and Twisted Confessions from Dead Bundy Get inside the demented mind of one, of America's most prolific serial killers in these chilling quotes. Everyone knows the name Dead Bundy. The notorious serial killer evokes disturbing images of victimized women and grisly police discoveries. His sheer number of victims aside, it was Bundy's ability to captivate an audience that made him an especially terrifying killer. Take a trip inside Bundy's twisted mind with ten of his most ominous, graphic, and manipulative confessions. I just said that the Hawkins girl's head was severed, and taken up the road about 25 to 50 yards and buried in a location about 10 yards west of the road, on a rocky hillside. Did you hear that? 1. Just days before he was executed in 1989, Ted Bundy sat down for a lengthy interview, with Detective Robert D. Keppel. In this never-before-heard audio footage, Bundy confesses the chilling details of how he killed, and dismembered Georgian Hawkins. Hearing the words in Bundy's actual voice makes the confession even creepier. 
We serial killers are your sons, we are your husbands, we are everywhere. And there will be more of your children dead tomorrow. 2. In one of the most memorable Bundy quotes, and certainly one of the most terrifying, the killer exhibits his uncanny ability to combine drama and cold-heartedness into a single sentence. I don't think anybody doubts whether I've done some bad things. The question is, what, of course, and how and, maybe even most importantly, why? 3. The above quote also came from Bundy's death, row interview with Keppel. Even after his trial, Bundy kept trying to manipulate people into believing, there was some intelligent motive, behind his killing spree. Unfortunately, Bundy picked the wrong person to try to manipulate, because Keppel wasn't buying it. When you work hard to do something right, you don't want to forget it. 4. Out of context the above quote seems harmless. But nothing in the world of, Ted Bundy is without a sickening backstreet. Bundy delivered the above rationale, when asked why he kept souvenirs, including body parts and Polaroids, from his victims. In my opinion, the best chance you have of catching this guy is to get a sight, with a fresh body and stake it out. 5. While on death row, Ted Bundy helped the Green River Killer Task Force, namely Detective Robert Keppel, understand the mind of a serial killer. This is Bundy's creepy advice for, how to find the notorious serial killer. I'm the most cold-hearted, son of a bitch you'll ever meet. 6. This might be one of the few times, Bundy was honest during an interview. The murderer shared this self isment while being interrogated following his 1979 arrest in Pensacola, Florida. Tell the jury they're wrong. 7. Given his exemplary ability to manipulate, it's difficult to tell if Bundy actually believes that he is innocent. Regardless of how Bundy felt, the jury felt little sympathy for the killer. I think I stand as much chance of dying, in front of a firing squad or in a gas chamber, as you do being killed on a plane flight home. Let's hope you don't. 8. Given his good looks and ability to captivate an audience, Bundy was a media favorite. Bundy gave an interview in 1977 from the Pitkin County Prison in Colorado, employing a quote worthy analogy, to stress his innocence. I'll tell you, as long as they attempt to keep their heads, in the sand about me, there's gonna be people turning up in canyons, and there are gonna be people being shot in Salt Lake City. Because the police there aren't willing to accept, what I think they know, and they know that I didn't do these things. 9. After being arrested for the kidnapped of Carol DeRonk, Ted Bundy stressed that he was innocent. In an animated interview, Bundy attacked the police, claiming that there was a conspiracy against him, and that the true criminal was still terrorizing the Salt Lake City community. I have dreamed about flying over those fences. I have dreamed about climbing over those fences, and tunneling under those fences. 10. Again speaking to the media. After his arrest for the kidnapping of Carol DeRonk, Bundy shared his desire to leave prison. Shortly after the interview, Bundy did escape and went on to kill again. His quote becomes a bleak reminder of, his ability to manipulate everyone around him. 6. Dean Corll. Dean Corll was never caught in his lifetime for the kidnapping, rape, torture, and murder of at least 28 boys in the early 70s. Corll aka the Candyman, was killed in 1973 by an accomplice while committing the rape of his final victim. Only then were his crimes revealed. Since he was killed, his true number of victims is still unknown, although he may have had a connection, to many other missing boys. A photograph of a handcuffed teenage boy, found in the possessions of an accomplice, of the Candyman has prompted concerns there is a 29th young victim, after it was found the boy does not match any records of known victims. Dean Corll, nicknamed the Candyman, because he gave young boys sweets from his family's business, and two other men, terrorized the Houston, Texas area between 1970 to 1973 abducting raping, torturing and murdering at least 28 young males. Now a filmmaker has found evidence, that there may be a 29th victim after he discovered a grainy Polaroid of a terrified young boy bent over on the ground, with handcuffs on and near a toolbox which matches, 
crime scene photos from inside Coral's home. Josh Vargas discovered the aged photo in the belongings of Coral's accomplice Elmer Wayne Henley. Henley helped Coral in the depraved killings until he shot him after a row. He gained access to the Henley's belongings after he interviewed his mother to gain information for a film he was making about the killings. She directed him to a school bus in an overgrown field where she had boxed up all her son's possessions after he confessed and the boxes had not been touched for decades. We were the first person who went through that stuff for 40 years, Mr. Vargas told KTRK. In a moldy box at the back of the bus, the filmmaker found a sealed photo envelope. While rummaging through those pictures, this Polaroid falls out, Vargas told ABC affiliate KTRK. I take a look at it and, right off the bat, having studied the case and the crime scene photos and everything, I see Dean's toolbox, and I see his implements in that toolbox, and I see this kid right here with handcuffs on his arms. When Mr. Vargas took the photo, to Henley in prison, he said he could not recall the victim but said, there were other young boys, who had still not been identified. Mr. Vargas gave the photograph, to the Harris County Medical Examiner's office, which reviewed the photograph and determined, it was not of any of the known victims. The filmmaker is now appealing for anyone, with any information about the identity of the young boy, in the photograph to come forward. As well as finding the Polaroid, Mr. Vargas has also used Henley's possessions in his new film, the actor playing him is wearing his old clothing from the bus, and the posters on the film, set are also from the 40-year-old stash. Even if we abandon the film project today, the greatest news could get would be that at least something came of this, maybe sand somebody may recognize their son, brother. Coral, along with his young accomplices, Henley and a David Brooks were responsible for, what was considered the worst mass murders the Houston areas had seen. Coral gained the nickname Candyman because he was known to give candy from his family's business to young boys. The wave of killings were only halted, when Henley shot him after an argument at Coral's flat. In custody, Henley confessed to the murder spree, and took the police to a bike shed where most of the victims had been buried, Juan Corona. While Juan Corona was working on a fruit ranch in California, he murdered at least 25 of his fellow migrant workers. The victims were brutally attacked and buried throughout Sutter County Fru trenches. The police believe there may still be some bodies that have been yet to be discovered. In 1971, Corona was sentenced to 25 life sentences. He was denied parole for the sixth time in December 2011. A California Review Board has once again denied parole to Juan Corona who was convicted of killing 25 itinerant farm laborers in what was once the worst serial murder case in U.S. history. The State Board of Parole hearings on Wednesday denied Corona's request for parole, his eighth appearance before the board. Now 82, Corona is not eligible for a hearing for five years, and will continue to serve his life sentence, at Corcoran State Prison, according to Luis Patino a spokesman for the State Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Corona has been behind bars since 1971, when a farmer in Sutter County came along a freshly dug hole in a peach orchard. The farmer, who had contracted with Corona to hire field workers, returned the next day, and saw the hole filled with dirt. To allay his suspicions, he called police. In the shallow grave, officers found a man's body with his head hacked and his body riddled with stab wounds. Corona was arrested a week later. Over the next two weeks, police recovered the bodies of more slain farm workers from shallow graves along the Feather River near Marysville, north of Sacramento. The vast majority of the 25 victims were hacked and stabbed to death. One was shot. The evidence against Corona was largely circumstantial, and much of the motive around the killings has remained a mystery. From Corona's home, and vehicles, investigators confiscated a green ledger book with the names of eight of the victims, along with an 18-inch machete, a post hole digger, a wooden club and a gun. Prosecutors also claimed they had a receipt, from a local butcher with Corona's name, and handwriting that was found in one of the graves. After a lengthy trial in 1973, 
Corona was sentenced to 25 consecutive life terms, a penalty so harsh that it elicited gasps in the courtroom, when the judge handed it down. But a state appellate court overturned the first conviction in 1978, blasting Corona's defense attorney, for mounting a farcical defense and calling no rebuttal witnesses to counter the prosecution's 119 witnesses. A second trial began in 1982, and was notable for Corona's defense offering an alternative theory behind the slayings. His attorney told jurors that it was Corona's late brother who carried out the killings, driven by a maniacal rage that originated in the frustration of a morbid sexuality. The lawyer argued that Corona was more mild-mannered than his brother, and innocent. After closing arguments took 12 days to complete, the jury of seven men, and five women convicted Corona of all charges. While in custody, he lost an eye from an inmate attack, his wife divorced him, he had at least two heart attacks, and he suffers from dementia. Corona intimated his guilt for the first time in a 2011 parole hearing, saying the men were winos and had trespassed in the orchards, the Associated Press reported. But Sutter County Dist. Attorney Amanda Hawk told the app that in Thursday's hearing, Corona appeared to walk back his earlier comments. When it had anything to do with killing the 25 people or his mental state, he conveniently could no longer remember, Hopper told the news service. He specifically said that, I don't remember that I killed anyone, I don't remember that I did anything. 8. Wayne Williams. Police arrested a monster on June 21, 1981. If their evidence was correct, Wayne Williams was responsible for one of the most horrific reigns of terror in American history. 29 African American children had been brutally murdered, along with at least two men in their late 20s. From 1979 until 1981, Atlanta was a city under siege. Parents were afraid to let their children leave the house, even to go to school. But that wasn't enough to keep them safe. In one of the most terrifying cases, Seven-year-old La Tanya Wilson was abducted, from her own bedroom in the early morning hours, of June 22, 1980. Her killer managed to carry her past her sleeping brother, and sister without anyone noticing. La Tanya's body was found four months later. The arrest of Williams should have been, cause for celebration. Certainly the police, and FBI were happy. But many residents were skeptical. Where was their monster? At 23, Williams was younger, than his last alleged victim. He'd been something of a local celebrity, who'd started a surprisingly successful ham radio station, when he was still in high school. He was soft-spoken, gentle, and cooperative. FBI profiler John Douglas of the Behavioral Science Unit said, he looked more like the Pillsbury Doughboy, than a serial killer. Atlanta's African American community responded to Williams' arrest with outrage. White supremacist groups were to blame for the murders, some said. The Klan was determined to wipe out their entire race. And yet Williams, as calm and soft-spoken as he was, fit the FBI's profile to a T. He was African American, most serial murders are committed by people of the same race. Besides, a white man could not have prowled the neighborhoods, where the children went missing without being noticed. He was single, and between the ages of 25, and 29. He was a police buff, who drove a police-type vehicle, and who tried to involve himself in the investigation. Williams had even been arrested for impersonating a police officer. He had a police-type dog a German Shepherd. Scratches had been seen on his face, and arms after some of the disappearances. Witnesses could place him with some of the victims, though he claimed he didn't know any of the missing children. Williams, with his goal of finding, and managing the next Jackson 5, had the perfect opportunity to approach young people, and win their trust. Although he had a book on, how to beat polygraphs, he still managed to fail a polygraph exam twice. Fibers from 19 sources, including his bedspread, carpeting, car, and dog, had been found on a number of the victims, this was long before DNA. The carpet fibers were considered highly significant since they were so rare. Williams was charged with the murder, 
of the two adult victims, Nathaniel Cater and Jimmy Payne, and received two life sentences. He is still in prison. While he was never tried, for the deaths of any of Atlanta's missing children, the police declared the cases closed. Understandably, the parents of the murdered children were furious, but the state explained it would be too expensive to try Williams for the rest of the murders. To this day, a lot of people think Williams is innocent, and that there is a police cover-up involved. Douglas, now retired from the FBI, believes the forensic and behavioral evidence shows that Williams killed at least 11 of the children. He had this to say in his book Mindhunter, despite what his detractors and accusers maintain, I believe there is no strong evidence, linking him to all or even most of the deaths and disappearances of children in the city, between 1979 and 1981. Young Black, and why children continue to die mysteriously in Atlanta. We have an idea who did some of the others. It isn't a single offender and the truth isn't pleasant. So far, though, there's been neither, the evidence nor the public will to seek indictments. Montana Police Sergeant John Cameron, suggested serial killer Edward Edwards was responsible, for some of the murders that plagued Atlanta, but he also thinks Edwards was the Zodiac Killer, and the murderer of John Bennett Ramsey, and Chandra Levy, among others, so that seems a tad far-fetched. In 2007, DNA testing on two human hairs, and several dog hairs found on some of the victims, failed to exonerate Williams. While there wasn't enough, of a sample for conclusive proof, the DNA sequence matched 1 in 100 dogs, including William Shepard, and the DNA in the hair samples would eliminate 99.5% of all African Americans. But not Williams. Williams continues to protest his innocence, and has never confessed to any of the murders, although, when asked by the prosecutor at his trial if he panicked when he killed those kids, Williams answered no before going ballistic and throwing a temper tantrum. That outburst on the stand may have led to Williams' conviction. Previously, the jurors were having a hard time, seeing the mild-mannered talent scout as a killer. 